Why don't we just start talking about the film a little bit, and, and Ira, I think maybe you might be the best person to get us started. Um, and I think the way for you to do that would be to tell us uh, why is love strange, and where did the title come from? Um, well, f uh, for those who don't know anything about what the story is, just to give you a, a brief uh, two-minute, two-second uh, description. The film is about a couple, uh, Ben and George, who've been together for 39 years. The first scene in the movie, they get married, and, and as a result, one of them loses his job as a choir director for a Catholic high school. That's Alfred Molina. And uh, they end up not being able to afford their New York apartment, so they just temporarily split up. Alfred moves in with two gay cops who live downstairs in his apartment building, and John's character, Ben, moves in with his nephew uh, and his nephew's wife, who's a novelist, Marissa Tomei. And, uh, the f and they have a teenage son. And the film is really about these two men trying to get back together, but also very fully, I, I hope, it's about all the relationships they encounter and the different generations uh, uh, that, that, that are, are sort of impacted by this separation. So it's a love story, and it's very much a New York film. For me, um, it's, a, it's, a, well, it's a lot of different things, but it's, it's a very personal film, and I felt for the first time in my life, in my 40s, I felt an optimism about love that um, makes for a different kind of film than the ones I'd made previously, which were all about the possibility of love to destroy everyone involved. <laughs> so, so this is a very hopeful film, and I think still, for each of us, love is very unique, and whether that be romantic love or, or uh, familial or communal, which are all things the film talks about, for each of, uh, Alfred Molina has said it very well, it's, uh, it's a Shakespearean use of the term strange, in the sense that strange is, is, a ma is magical, and what about love is unique for all of us. Well, let me, let me bring in Mauricio for a moment, and uh, you and Ira wrote this film together. Uh, tell me about yes. some of the early conversations you had about love and, how, and the many different ways you would be exploring it through these many different characters, the Shakespearean aspects of its strangeness, and some of the early conversations that you had. Ira's already talked about and here and in other places about how personal this film is. I think your role is crucial in helping to draw that out of him and, and help him work through, I would imagine, how to tell such a personal story or aspects of, of a story that are so personal. So tell, tell us about that collaboration and some of those conversations that yeah, you had. Um, we, we first started uh, thinking about this when Ira told me about his um, uncle who is, who's had been uh, married for, I don't know how many years, but many, many years. Uh, he was a sculptor and uh, his gay uncle, and he had been living with his partner for many years in a very happy uh, relationship. And uh, that was the first image we had. I mean, it was very much what we wanted. We knew we wanted to talk about that type of love, you know, an enduring long-term love that if you ask these people, um, how they feel, they would do, if they could go back in time, they would do the same thing all over again. That, you know, it, and it's very, it's very um, rare that we see that on screen. So that was the first <coughs> image we had. And then um, we started, um, we knew we also wanted to tell an intergenerational story. We didn't want to just concentrate on that couple. Um, and so we needed a story a plot to open the story up to other people in their family. Um, so we read in the newspaper what was happening um, with um, men who were getting married and, and worked in, uh, in Catholic institutions and you know the problem that they were having. Uh, that gave us the uh, idea for the for the engine to to run the, the plot and, and open the story um, because then we would make it, it would make it possible for them to separate and, uh, and uh, the, the problems would begin and finally, you know, we would um, talk about the rest of the family because they would have to live with these people. Um, for me, it was very, um, 
my parents have been married for 50 years, so um, when we started working on this, I mean, that was the inspiration that I had. Um, they've been together for such a long time and they've been happily married and every time I'm with them, I feel this, you know, warmth and, and uh, it, was, it was something that I wanted to put in the film also. Um, and when we decided to um, talk about the nephew with the wife and the son, uh, we knew that we wanted to talk about uh, the different stages of love. Uh, the, the other couple who are in the middle of a relationship that's starting to prove difficult and also... <laughs> <laughs> And also her son, who is starting to discover love for the first time. So with that, we thought we would open the story to the different you know, stages of love. Well, we'll talk more about the stages of love in a moment, and I want to ask Ira about that, but I also want to bring in John and Marissa. Um, John, first of all, as we've learned and as we've heard, the film is about two men and their relationship over, over decades. But it's also a universal story. It's also about, uh, it, it's specific and it's universal. Tell us a bit more about um, their relationship, these two characters. Give People haven't seen the movie yet, so give us a bit more of an understanding of the dynamic and then how you, um, how you sort of immersed yourself in this particular role. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm a little, I always feel a little bereft talking about this film without Alfred Molina sitting next to me because it is, I really never acted such a relationship in a film. Uh, I've never, uh, an arc that's, it's so, it's such a complete portrait of a, of a relationship. As I put it, it's a film with one uh, starring role played by two actors, and the starring role is the relationship, mm -hmm. uh, with several extraordinary relationships in satellites, like satellites orbiting around them. Fred is a simply extraordinary man and actor. Uh, we had been friends for a good 20 years before uh, we ended up being cast together. He was cast in the film when it was offered to me, and I read this remarkable script by Mauricio and Ira, which reads like the fine, just the finest fiction or playwriting. And I, I knew that I was being asked to play opposite Fred in this. It was fully formed. I just knew this was going to be, uh, 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 it was going to be easy, it was going to be fun and comfortable and real. And, uh, and we were going to make a fantastic couple. <laughs> and, and we did. It, it, was, it was simply effortless. Uh, the, I'm trying to tread uh, gingerly because I don't want to give anything away. It, it, the, 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 the film has a wonderful way of taking people by surprise. But I think what's surprise, so surprising about it is how ordinary it is. Uh, this is just a, a very prosaic look, which before you know it becomes a very poetic look at an older couple. You just don't see many older couples anyway, let alone older gay couples. And it puts a face on this extremely hot button issue. Uh, uh, marriage equality, same sex marriage, gay marriage. These are the people who are genuinely affected by what's been happening in this revolution of the last few years. Until now, you take the, the two most notable men associated with this issue were David Boies and Ted Olson, <laughs> uh, the, the, the lawyers who managed to overturn Prop 8. These are the guys who are really affected. And what's incredibly moving to us is the older men who have come forward. Ira and I did a, a, uh, an internet interview for HuffPost today, and there was one a phone-in question from a, an older couple in Arkansas, men older than me, uh, who had seen the film and it had meant so much to them. I, right there on camera, I burst into tears. It was so moving. Uh, this is what's so unusual. 
It's a very simple film, a very quiet film in its way, so ironically, it's a very revolutionary film at the same time. Did I answer your question? I've lost track about you 10 minutes You absolutely ago. did. You absolutely <laughs> Nicely did. Nicely said. <laughs> um, Marissa, I, I ask you to riff on that in the, to the extent that, you know, there's many different ways that you might have approached this film. The script, the subject matter, um, the city of New York plays a, plays a role. It's a, it's, a, it's a supporting character in this. Um, if you could take us back to your reading of the script, what was it that struck you first about this? Well, I actually wanted to do the film before reading it because I knew that Ira was about to do a film and I was working with the parts and labor, the same producers of this film were doing another film that I was just wrapping and they were very upset one day because someone had dropped out of this film <laughs> and uh, I kind of sniffed that I might be able to get in there. <laughs> I, and I, had, I, I was such a fan of Ira's work and um, had even seen, uh, and Keep the Lights On I saw last year, but I'd seen many of his films. So I just was, and I, I really wanted to work with Ira, so it was mostly that was the main thing. And um, uh, I was also at a point in my life uh, or in I just wanted to be with uh, intimacy on a set, and I, and I wanted to be with people telling stories about real people, and, um, and so it did fit the bill for, for what I was really aching for. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, the terms that are coming up, Ira, intimacy, sort of quiet nature, the sort of, It's you like know, this room. It is. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're gonna watch a clip in a moment, and that's my signal to the booth to get ready, but. Um, tell us about creating that camaraderie, facilitating that camaraderie. The first clip we're going to look at is, uh, is our two grooms on their wedding day. They're at the piano and they're, uh, they're uh, singing a song together and we're going to see that in a moment. But, but, but before we do that, uh, maybe picking up on some of the things that, that John and Marissa were talking about, how did you sort of foster and, and maintain that, that, yeah. that energy that comes across on the screen if you see the movie? Yeah. It's nice to hear Marissa say that about the second half of because because that was something that that I remember when we first started talking is that she was looking for a different kind of opportunity in terms of and I and I'm I feel like we had that and that experience occurred where we got to do something very intimate and personal for all of us I think I think there's a lot revealed about the actors and them and in the film um, you know for me I have very specific strategies of how to create um, what I'm looking for on set and and it, it begins with actually building the world um, so that uh, these actors, and, and that includes costume and wardrobe and, and background. For example, in this scene, um, you will see um, a lot of faces who are the faces of the community that surrounds Ben and George. And um, I spent a lot of time casting background, as, as Shade knows, and, and uh, getting the right, really the anthropology of this world. And I felt very good because on the day of this shoot, um, two of the faces you will see met each other and they hadn't, they were both artists, a man and a woman, and they hadn't seen each other since the 1950s <laughs> when they had both graduated um, from Columbia in the uh, Masters in Fine Arts painting program. And they were both painters of New York who were still creating work who had, in different ways, I had found and, and we've gotten to this scene. And they were the people who would know Ben uh, a painter in his early 70s, and, and I felt like, okay, that's why the scene works on some level. What I then try to do is, uh, I speak with each of the actors separately about the script and we talk through things very closely, but, but I never have done, I don't do conventional rehearsals, so on the day of the shoot, we've never heard the lines read. Um, the other actor um, doesn't really have an idea of what to, to expect when he hears or she hears. Uh, a line read because that's really what we're trying to capture is the response and I do block and we do you know we get there and we block but it's the day of and there's two words that I think should be banned from a film set are subtext and motivation because those words <laughs> really try to pin down the impossible things that, that film can capture that you can't pin down 
So you hope for that spontaneity. Um, spontaneity. So in this scene, you guys had never sang this song before in front of anybody but each other, as Ben and George would have only sung with each other until this. And, uh, and let me add, what you're about to see is the first time Fred and I did any work at all on the film. Yes. It was the very first thing we did, and it makes me so proud, because it looks like these two guys have been together for 40 years. Um, I'm also going to say, we're about to see the clip? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I've been doing press all day, drinking nothing but water and coffee. While you're watching it, I'm gonna sneak off to the men's room. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not walking out. <laughs> Well done. One of our colleagues will make sure you find your way up the stairs. Let's, uh, let's bring down the lights and let's take a look at uh, the first clip. We call it Piano. Um, in the movie, it's in sync. So. Yeah, it's not a... It's not a <laughs> it looked a little out of sync, at least from here. I don't yeah. know about that. A little out of sync, okay. So you'll go see it in the theater and you can see that scene in sync. <laughs> the movie opens this Friday here in New York City and yeah. uh, other cities as well, or is it starting in New York? It opens uh, Friday at the Angelica, the Lincoln Plaza, and the, the Chelsea Bowtie, and in LA it opens on Friday at the Arclight and the Landmark, so, and then it will be rolling out for it, hopefully everywhere. Well, it, so. it goes without saying, and we, we say this always at these talks, um, by being here today, you're getting a preview, but part of the pact you're making with, with the filmmaker and with the folks involved is that you'll go see it on the big screen in the theater this weekend. It makes a difference. And for take five friends. Yes. <laughs> so if you, uh, if you agree to that, please uh, say aye. And applaud. <laughs> Great. Um, Ira was talking about uh, the way he works with actors. Uh, Marissa and John, maybe you can elaborate about that from your vantage point. Um, he talked about a very specific a way that and a way that he works with with performers. Maybe you can elaborate on on how that worked for you and and how that's unique or distinctive, if um, it is. Well, we got together um, to to talk through the scenes. Actually, <laughs> I kind of dragged it out of you. He does. He really does not like to tell you anything about the character <laughs> at all. But I did find it. I didn't relate as easily as um, John was saying. He related. Uh, and and, uh, and has, has talked about being able to slip into the shoes of the character. I, I, was, I, I was far from the character in, in my personal life, but also I just, I, I, it, there was just things that weren't adding up in my, that I couldn't follow. So uh, we went through it, and he was patient with me, and we went through the scenes. We made a couple of adjustments, and then, um, then mostly I focused on what I was going to wear, right? <laughs> if I remember correctly, um, that always does help. <laughs> and um, but on the set, uh, it it was it, because of what he was talking about, like those faces you just saw. I mean, that was the first day. I guess it was the first day I shot too. So. It, you just walked in, and the apartment, the art direction, the place we were in, and those faces. I just knew where we were. It. it he had laid the table. So it was easy to step in without the rehearsal that, that he doesn't like to have. I don't like to have it either, so that worked out really well. And, um, but, but, he's, but you're willing to, uh, with questions, I mean, you can, uh, you can ask him questions. Uh, <laughs> um, but he, he really, uh, he so thoroughly knows the characters and the, and the place and the message, or you know, whatever he, he really, the intent of why he's doing all of this is so close to the bone and to his heart that uh, the, the information is just really accessible. And, um, and, and also, I, I would add to that also just the way he speaks to you and, or spoke to me and gave me direction was very, uh, in a very uh, calm and intimate manner, <laughs> just kind of the themes of all of this. And so it helped convey to me the kind of the tone that my character herself would actually use in her voice and, and how she would express herself. Um, different from how I would, maybe. <laughs> but as I talk with my hands and I'm really boisterous, but that's not really how my character is. But it, it was helpful to speak to Ira before. Well, I'll just make one comment about that. Is, is you say I know what I want, and the truth is I don't. Um, <laughs> but that doesn't mean I don't know where I'm going. 
And I'm very because That's I what actually I mean. yeah, yeah yeah I'm just have that I, I'm I'm actually very I think I, on a set a lot of what I'm doing is trying to be very observant and then act on some level of of my actors and you do really have to take care of actors. It's a very magical thing that happens on set. And, on a, and in a film set, people lose consciousness of that because everybody's kind of a family except the actors are doing this extraordinarily unreal thing, which is making very real moments happen. So you have to be very careful with them. But, but a lot of what I'm doing is really, um, I, I think, trying to see who the actors are in the scene and what they're bringing as individuals that is really shaping this dialogue that we've created into something that is not mine. Uh, and since you've just seen that clip, and since Marissa mentioned Ira setting the table for every, everybody, let me talk a little bit about the set. Uh, that set included, that apartment, it included a photograph that Fred Molina happened to own of him and me about 20 years ago in black tie at, a, uh, at an award ceremony, you know, with our arms around each other. We only just met, but, you know, Ira grabbed onto that. It became part of the set dressing. There's a small painting uh, of me, a portrait of me, which was painted one afternoon by Boris Torres, uh, Ira's husband, who happens to have done the paintings that Ben, ben we haven't mentioned it, but Ben is a painter, uh, as he, he generated. I am an, a, a painter manque. It's what I first wanted to be, was a painter. One of the things that excited me about the role. So Boris and I worked together an entire afternoon on coming up with a common painting technique, something that the two of us could share uh, because there is a, a, an extended sequence in which I actually paint a picture and that half-finished picture becomes an important part of the plot. Well, if you look carefully, th that little portrait that Boris painted of me that afternoon is sitting on an easel in a corner. And also, one of the paintings on the wall is a painting of mine from when I was in Brazil in the early 90s uh, doing at play in the fields of the Lord. Ira called and said, can you, can you get a photographer to take a photograph that we can blow up so that we can use it to dress the set? What I'm saying is, he takes from everybody uh, he takes our input. He wanted to know all about my history. Uh, in the weeks before we started shooting, I was working on a film in Calgary, Alberta. Fred was at his home in Los Angeles. Ira took two separate trips, one to Canada, one to LA, just to spend an entire two days, my two days off from shooting, just talking with me, learning my own history, going through, through the script as he did with Marissa, finding what I could bring that would enhance his own <laughs> sense of the character. It was a gift. I mean, you, you don't get that kind of thing from a director. I, it certainly had never happened to me before. All of this in lieu of actually sitting and, and rehearsing. We never read through the script. I, Marissa and I never spoke a line together until the camera was running. Uh, he wanted the all the... He wanted it all catch fire in front of a camera. He didn't want it in a rehearsal room. I'm blushing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's very nice, um, uh, but I, you know, I think in a way, I just know what I need. And it's it's really about f figuring out. You know, it's it's my fifth film, and certain things that have that have worked, and certain strategies, and 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 so it's it's about being driven creatively to to be to to. to to get the most out of what you have. Um, you know, one thing we haven't really mentioned is I had, um, and this was not something I don't think, Mauricio and I wrote a, 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 f a script that has some, some funny lines in it, and some, it's, not a, it's, not a, you know, it's not a laugh riot, but it, it's got some, <laughs> there's a lot of humor in it, but what I didn't know is that I've cast two, and these two actors, Alfred also, but specifically Marissa and John, who are brilliant comic actors. 
And, and to me, that is a, a huge compliment. It's, it's, it's in the sense that they can find the comedy in the dramatic situations that the film presents. And their timing, and they have this one scene. I don't, are you going to show that scene? Um, it's going to be out of sync if you see I don't it. Know we'll, I don't know if we'll make you <laughs> see another scene. OK, yeah. So there's a great scene between the two of I'm them. I'm so glad I was going to the bathroom. Yeah, well, <laughs> it was like, but there's a great scene between the two, these two. And it's really a set piece comic dramatic scene and 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 Marissa's trying to work in the apartment and John is chatting and and being just a little annoying but and Marissa's it's so complex and and in terms of the range of emotions she she experiences and I think that many people connect to uh, it in really that scene. is one of my favorite scenes I've ever yeah. been in just an <laughs> exquisite piece of writing and Marissa's an amazing acting fun. partner. It was just it great. Was We're very proud of that. <laughs> um, I really only have one more question before we turn it over to the audience, and there are going to be microphones on the sides, so uh, get your questions ready. Um, this film, um, kind of, in my view, it, it quietly but confidently wades into a political moment, a cultural moment, a historical moment in, its, um, in the way it addresses marriage equality. So to anybody on the panel... Um, on the, in this group here, um, maybe you could speak to that. Uh, speak to what you hope this film will achieve, what it does achieve, what it documents. Um, again, this is such an important moment, culturally, historically, politically, and and the way this film addresses it is so subtle but yet so powerful to me. I um, I'll start. <laughs> I've started. Um, I to me the. The best, the most effective uh, political um, pieces of, of art I've seen are the non, the, the quiet ones, the ones that are not political. Um, and, um, and we never try to make a political film at all. And, and, it, and, and um, in a way, I think that if makes people um, relate to something that they're not willing to, and I think this film can do that. I really hope that it's a film that will make some people that wouldn't, wouldn't even want to get close to this kind of subject go and actually feel something. And I think that that would be f the, the best thing that I, I could achieve with my work. And, and, and I've seen it happening already, and it's wonderful um, uh, just to see that people who would not want even to get close and now, you know, they've seen something that moved them and they feel changed. It's, it's true, the, uh, we didn't set out to make a niche film for just uh, gay people or people on the side of gay people in, in this issue. We didn't set out to make a, a polemical film uh, or make a political statement it was just about these people and their emotions. But you're absolutely right, Maurice. You have, it, it, it is a film which, best case scenario, it, it can actually open up people's consciousness that little bit. Uh, you know, there's this kind of tide of history that goes from prejudice to tolerance to acceptance, but those words, tolerance and acceptance, in themselves are patronizing words. What the consummation devoutly to be wished is the point at which something becomes taken for granted. When people are simply, it's simply not a big deal anymore. The remarkable thing about this film is no big deal is made. Uh, out of uh, out of these two men getting married, it's a very very special moment for them, but it's it's a it's it's a mark of how acceptance is gradually moving move trending toward simply being taken for granted as a result uh, as a reality that people can simply accept and almost ignore, and uh, that's what makes me it makes me feel wonderful to be a part of this. I, I don't know that I have more to add okay. other than I feel like that I, I think of it as just universal and a, and a love story so much that, yeah. that it does it does it 
Well, it's sort John's of as, talking about. At what, the way you're saying that, I think for most of us, these separations, are lo at least a lot of people in this in this room and in this country and in, in, in the culture that we live in, these separations are no longer distinctions that we make with the people we know and with our family and with our friends and with our gay friends and our straight. It just isn't, the, the walls aren't there for so many. And I think this film speaks to that. Um, it's interesting that you use the word quiet confidence because those are the two terms, the words, I use the word humility and confidence to describe Ben and George, this, the central characters and what I really love about them and why I wanna hang out with them. Mm -hmm. um, and to some extent this is the same with John and Alfred is that um, they have those two, there's a lot of humility and there's a lot of confidence and it's very appealing. And I think that is um, something that is, it's, you know, people have asked why do these guys not fight back and go to the streets and that's not who they are. But, but there's a scene early in the movie where, where Alfred is, is fired from his job and, and you can see that he's upset and he's angry but he is definitely not going to be anything other than who he is. And that is appealing for as gay men, but it's appealing just in any people. I mean, to me, the film is, 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 is a film that tries to do what the neorealists used to do, which is make the ordinary extraordinary. And if you do that, and, and, and through a portrait, then there is a, there's an intimacy you have with those other people, which you also hopefully have with yourself in watching the movie. So all those things are the ways that I think art can hopefully subtly influence experience. Okay, well let's see what the audience wants to ask you. Uh, if you have a question, raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you so that folks who are watching this podcast at home can listen, can hear your question. Um, we'll go down here to the front row first and then we'll go into the second row to Jim. Hi. Thank you. I recently saw you twice in King Lear, and I thought you were brilliant. And you, you are and were. And I'm wondering what special, what, what did you have to do to prepare for this role and the challenges that you encountered in the preparation, please? Uh, well, it's interesting that you should mention King Lear in this context, because I started preparing for King Lear in March. I started learning the lines, getting in shape, growing a beard. It was a really, it was two or three months of preparation before the first day of rehearsal, and we had five weeks of rehearsal. And I was only barely ready to perform it when we first performed it. This was completely the opposite. Uh, I mean, King Lear was King Lear. It was an extremely acted performance, and I was doing it on the stage of the Delacorte Theater, which is, uh, for 1,800 people, it was a big performance. I took advantage of every inch of my six-foot-four height. You know, <laughs> boom, it was big, and this is a small performance. When I first met with Ira, I read the script, and then I went off to meet him the next day, I was already sold on this film on the basis of the script and the fact that Fred was going to be playing the part. But I was completely charmed by Ira. We were co very much on the same wavelength. And I remember at one point in our conversation, Ira, I said, you know, it will be, if I do this, I, ho I sure hope this works out, if I do this, it'll be such a relief not to do any acting. And he said, well, what do you mean by that? And, you know, <laughs> but I think, I think he knew exactly what I meant. It was, it was just such an effortless, it was clearly going to be an effortless job. The more effort I put into it, the worse the performance would be. Uh, and that's how it felt the whole time. I just felt like I was putting on an old, frayed, knit cardigan when I put on this role. No effort at all not even any preparation beyond listening to Ira talk and talking back to him. Uh, let's go here to the second round, Jim. Uh, thank you, Ira. Uh, and thank you. The generosity of the actors so comes across on the screen that they really like being in this film. I mean, that having seen the film. Um, I wanted to ask a question. My favorite scene is the one between Marissa and John 
the writing scene because to me it's about family. It's about um, the alternative family in many ways that gays and lesbian people have always had to create up until today. And it's about the village, you know, where Marissa grew up. So Ira, you became a parent. Your films previously were a lot about outsiders. This seems to be about an insider in the village in a very normalized situation that doesn't exist in many other parts of America. How did you make this transition in the storytelling? Uh, yeah, uh, life got better. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think uh, my last film was called Keep the Lights On, and, and it was a very autobiographical film about self-discovery, really. And, and I've realized that all my previous films were films of self-discovery, which means they were also films of alienation, people trying to figure out how they fit into the world. And um, in my own life, not because of the kind of signifiers of I've, I've married my husband who is a wonderful, I, I love him deeply and I can imagine having a long life with him, but the fact that we're married and the fact that we have, we're raising two kids, we have twins that we're raising with their mom who lives next door to us, so we really do have a village <laughs> taking care of these two kids. Um, those are, are kind of symbols of, of, of of, of coming maybe, you know, of, of normalcy or something, but I don't think the symbols really matter because all those things, as, as you can see in Marissa's character in the film, they don't, marriage doesn't define anything except as a law on some level. Um, so for me, it's about achieving some sort of comfort with, with myself and I think that's really changed the films and, and that's why I'm presenting characters who are more comfortable with themselves than you've seen in my previous work. And I do think that that relates to, I'm also an example of how laws and culture change lives. And we're talking about how the film can do it, but I think I represent a lot of people who feel differently internally as the world reflects them differently. Let's go down here, Shay, do you have a question? I just find this so interesting. I did background on this movie for three days and I was at the wedding reception and the wedding and me walking, I've been on a number of sets, you know, a lot of Hollywood and we never get to interact with the stars. But this day we were there, this woman taps on my shoulder and says, oh, hi, I'm Marissa. Oh, hi. And she walked around, you know, like with cookies or so. It was great. But when you guys were sitting at the piano, I did not know until now that that was the first day of shooting. It looked like you guys had just been working together and living together and being those characters. And Marissa gave that speech. I don't know how you, you know, and, and you swung your armor. I think you had tears. And us, background, and there were a number of Ira's friends who had never been on a set at all. And you could see them reacting to what you guys were doing. It was great. I just, I just wanted, that's amazing that that was the first day. We had never seen that. I also really liked what uh, Alfred did to uh, mellow everybody out because some of the extras were really tight and they weren't dancing. And he said, I'm naked and I've got a stock of celery up my ass. And it worked. It worked. So anyways, I, that was really cool to see. And as a background person, being able to interact with you guys in that really hot room, which you can't tell, and we couldn't turn on the air conditioning and blah, blah, blah. Thank you very much. I mean, you really made everyone feel like we were a family. It was great. It was a very interesting experience, and it's interesting to know that that was happening for you also. Well, you, may, you contributed to that. It was great to have you there. I would like to ask you all a question. Raise your hands if you have been to a, a same-sex wedding. A grandmother of one. You know, I, I've, I've been to only one, right in the middle of our shooting period. And I've been to a lot of weddings, but this was the only one between two men. And I have, I've never experienced such an in intensity of emotion. The marriage sacrament was so incredibly important just because for so long it's been, it's been ruled out and it was finally granted to these men. And I think when you talk about this being an incredible historical moment for this film, right. 
You're absolutely right. I think it, it supercharges the emotions of this film. Well, one of the things I'd, I've never thought of till now is that when you see at the beginning of a movie a marriage between two men, um, you actually know a lot of history of the challenges that got them there. You can feel that they've actually were at the were at something. They represent a lot of pain and a victory. I mean, that's not true if you open a, most movies with a wedding. Uh, you, don't, you don't know that history has not been as charged. So it's, it's powerful just in the fact that it represents such a shift. You know? yeah. When you think about it, if weddings are featured at all in the movies, it's almost always at the end. And they're almost always straight. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a, just a couple more questions because they have to I, all leave soon. I think that's because it's hard to write about love. I think the weddings come at the end of most movies because people don't are, aren't tapping into the kind of experience and and have done the reflection and have the depth uh, and the, and have developed their own hearts. It's it's just hard to it's a, it's yeah. hard to write about, and that's what I think is also extraordinary about it's extraordinary about this film, and that's why you can start it with a wedding and then talk about love rather than, how are we gonna get to love? Oh, everything's a mess, I don't know, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, finally we're married. That's when a lot of the, that's, yeah. that's, the, that's, when, life that's when life starts. And th that's harder to write about. Mauricio and I were both aware of, of a series of comedies that were made in the 1930s. They're, you can call them the remarriage comedy. And there are films like The Palm Beach Story, and It Happened One Night, mm -hmm. and uh, The Lady Eve, which all, because of the 30s, one of the ways they did it is they got married couples to split up so you could watch them come back together and, and understand their love through the struggles of, of reuniting. It's also the structure of the Shakespearean comedy. So, um, you know, it's a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, who wants the last question? We're almost out of time. Raise your hand high, and we'll bring a microphone to you. This is your last chance. Okay, we'll go here to the front row. Um, we'll just need a microphone right up here. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I guess Ira and Mauricio can answer this question. You talked a lot about um, putting a lot of yourselves into the movie and asking the actors to put a lot of themselves into it. Was there any, any concern maybe about putting too much of yourselves on screen, maybe for people close to you who might know these things or just that concern about maybe opening yourselves up too much on screen? You wanna start with that? Yeah, no, I, I never worried about that, putting too much of, of of myself and the people that inspired me in the movie. I'll tell you one thing, there is, there is a scene, you guys don't even know this, but there is a scene um, when the two of them go watch, they go to a concert, to a music concert together. And it's just, you know, it's just a quiet scene, they're watching the music being played. And in the, in, in a, in a romantic moment of the music, um, ben reaches his hand and, and they just hold hand and that's completely inspired by my mom and dad. I mean, uh, we came, they've been married for 40 something years and we, come, we go see a show, Broadway show, and, and all of a sudden, I, you know, I'm sitting next to them and I see my mother reaching her hand and they're holding hands and I thought that was so extraordinary. I said that, you know, so um, also because of the, rela the, 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 the type of story, it would be different if you had been keep the lights on. Because <laughs> that's, uh, you know, <laughs> that, that we will have to have permission of the, of the inspiration character to, to put that on screen. But with this film, no. It was actually, I told my mother, she, she, my mother is visiting and she saw the movie last night and I told her that that scene was inspired by her and, and I'm very proud to do that. Uh, that's, that his mother's, by the way, seeing Joshua Bell right now, who's, who's a friend of John's. Um, uh, I, in this film, there was, it's funny that you, you asked that question, because last night, um, in the film, uh, uh, Alfred's character moves in with two gay policemen who, who, who live downstairs. And, and when I first met my um, husband, he was living in a, a townhouse in, in the West Village, and he lived on the first floor, and on the second floor was a wonderful man who has since died, who was in his late 70s, named Michael Zimmer. And he was a very eccentric New York Greenwich Village gay man who had a great 
wardrobe, which John really, the look of the character of Ben is Michael Zimmer when you see it. And on the top floor were two gay cops. And we would often spend time as a kind of village family um, having meals and watching TV and, and doing things together. And so we wrote these characters. Alfred moves in with these two gay cops. And, and, uh, um, and at one point, uh, Alfred says that he and Ben, that they would often call them the police women. <laughs> And it was just one line, and it gets a little joke. It's a, it's, it's a cute line, and, and it was true, but last night was the first night that these two cops actually saw the film. <laughs> and, and I was really nervous about that. And I saw them, and they loved it. And, they were, and, then, and then suddenly they were like, someone was like, so what did you think of that policewoman line? And they were like, oh, did you, did you guys, did you really call us that? <laughs> And I said, well, it, Michael Zimmer did, and he's, he's no longer with us. <laughs> so besides that, I felt very comfortable, and it's over, and everyone hugged, and it's okay. Well, um, as I said earlier, the film is Love is Strange. It opens in New York City this Friday. Um, our guests have to get to another event, so if you will do me a favor and stay in your seats, let them make their way up the stairs, it will really help them get on to their next event. But before we do that and let them leave, let's give them a big round of applause and thank them for their time today.